All right, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about best games pre-1920. 1920 is both the end of World War I and also when Lasker hands off his title without a fight to Capablanca. So that seemed like a watershed moment to stop. Definitely a change of generations. Chess starts to look a little different after. Could have been stopped at any given point. But our general idea is we want some games, both for our own enjoyment and ranking the best games, and to kind of use this discussion as fodder for the games we pick for the training program for games to memorize. Every cohort has a games, game to memorize. And it's our hope that eventually we'll get vids up talking about each of these games. <laughs> and so we're going to do a top five here for pre-1920. The intention is then to do another list for 1920 to Fisher, 1972, and then another one for 1972 on. And if we're still into this project, if we haven't killed each other yet, we'll do a top 10 total, all time. We'll see. But even today, tensions are high. Will Proust put in all Philidor games because he is the greatest player of all time? Will it happen? Will Will the dojo explode? I don't know. We're going to find out, Mike. We're going to find it. So we're yeah. going to rank them. And then like in all these shows, we'll do a final kind of dojo top five for, uh, for, for the end. And we also have the right to change our opinions at the end. We can shift it around if someone has convinced us. This show's a little different as well as that one of the reasons we're not doing as many games is we're going to try to take a look at each of the games under consideration. Yeah. Not only do we have a right to change our minds, but some of us have the ability to change our minds. Oh. Ooh. Shots fired <laughs> off the bat. I love it. Um, all right. Let me um, also just say, I think my mic's a little bit loud. Let me turn that down a bit. Um, let me also just say that, uh, like Jesse said, this is going to be a three-part podcast. So we're ranking the best games ever. Um, if you're listening to this, it might be a good idea to check out the YouTube video of this, these episodes, because we're going to be showing the games um, with like an actual chessboard um, and playing through them for anyone that hasn't seen the games as we're kind of discussing them. Um, we'll try to keep the conversation, I mean, relatively listenable. So someone could just listen to it and still enjoy it. It's not going to be super like variation heavy, I imagine. But, um, but yeah, just a heads up, we're going to be showing some chess games. So you might want to watch on YouTube. Um, and yeah, we've got our top six up here okay six is going to be more of like a, a honorable mention and then we got our top five and we'll average those out and then we'll get some kind of uh top 10 and that's cool i didn't know we we're gonna do an overall top 10 from all three periods that's awesome let's definitely do that yeah we have to still get along after this first couple podcasts <laughs> <the> first, buddy. <laughs> uh, it'll be fine um okay oh who wants i feel wants like to go first I feel like this show is very clearly an opinion kind of thing. So I don't think that I will lose my mind no matter what games you guys pick, really. Because it's I I feel like it's very open to opinion. Like you could pick my 20th best game as your best game, and I wouldn't think it was a big deal. Whereas if you picked the 20th best player as the best player, I would be pretty shocked. Um so here I think it's very much about like your personal taste. And it's like if you say that tofu is your favorite food it's kind of hard for someone else to tell you that it's not actually your favorite food david there's no way tofu is your favorite food <laughs> <laughs> it's not garlic is <laughs> okay so are we gonna do this we're gonna do the snake right we're gonna do the snake snake all right coach do you want me to start or david always gets the middle of the snake i don't know how that happened uh, do you want me to start or you want to go first, buddy? By the way, number six, I don't think we're going to show it. We're just going to say it, but that game gets a point as an honorable mention as number six. Um, Up to you. I'm happy to start either way. Whatever you guys want. Okay. Want let, Jesse, go, let Jesse start. I'll Let's go first. Uh, so my number six is Steinitz Paulson. Okay. Steinitz Paulson. Very interesting <laughs> game. Originally, this was a game that... Uh, that Kostya reminded me of by putting it in his initial list. I don't know if it's going to be in his list, um, but it features a king walk. And basically, if you put it in a strategic sense, I would say what's interesting about the game 
is we have the loss of king security in exchange for central control. And then that central control leads to a mating attack. So very modern and ballsy game. Yeah. It was an example definitely of Steinitz pushing his strategic ideas to a kind of extreme, right? He's like, the center is so valuable that I'm going to overprotect it with my king. I, I don't know what <laughs> Nimzovich would have said. But, but it wasn't just like a situation where he's like, I'm taking over the center and because I'm busy taking over the center, I didn't take care of my king and my king got checked once. No, even once his king was on E2, he was like, forward, the center needs to be supported. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. All that's, right. Um, what do you, yeah. No, let me just say that that's a great game. Um, I did like a top 10 list and that was number, number seven on my list. So it's like an honorable, honorable mention for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, great game. Everyone should go check out that game. Um, relatively uh, well-played game, like according to to the engine, which is surprising, like with the king on E2 and E3. Honestly, like a very kind of like almost the modern style. Um, but but yeah, really, really shy. and And like a very nice combination and like sacrifice in that game as well. That people yeah, the attack, check out. the attack on the queen side is, is well done. Um, exactly. Jesse, I recently found out that you used to play the Smith Mora Gambit. Did you ever play the King's Gambit and or rush your king to e3 in a game of your own? Um, I am a principal player and I will never play the King's Gambit. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> I I have actually rushed my king to e3 uh -huh. a couple times. And um it it's gone poorly sometimes. I've tried to copy yeah. this exact game. And uh, yeah, <laughs> one game was one of my worst. <laughs> David, you should um, you should be the one to make make a video on that game. Um, yeah, probably, because I have some firsthand experience with my king on E3. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, you're number six. OK, my number six, I'm not going to talk too much about about it because i'm pretty sure one of you has it a little has it a little bit higher and you can give it a, a talk but it's steinitz von bartleben uh kind of the immortal rage quit game uh <laughs> which i think i think we may have mentioned at some point like maybe last week you know the fact that steinitz played this game when he was 60 years old uh as a measure of his longevity and the fact that he could still calculate as an old man which is pretty darn impressive but um i'll let one of you guys show it a little bit later on in the show okay yeah. cool battle of hastings oh are you on the sheet by the way do you want to enter it in sure sure i can put it in hey we both have steinitz at number six jesse there we go man yeah and actually you know what's actually interesting for chess fans to think about is steinitz in 1870 is an entirely different person as somebody in the 1880s and then 1890s we're obviously dealing with an old man but the shift from early Steinitz to late Steinitz is happening in the 1870s, where you know he basically invents positional chess. So it's two totally different people in a lot of ways between yeah. those two guys. Yeah. Absolutely All right, Costa, what do you got? We will cover this game in a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. My number six game. Um, actually, let me let me just say a couple things about my list here. Um, so obviously these lists are very subjective and everyone has their own opinions about like what the greatest games of all time are. And, um, I think, I think that's fine. That's great. Sometimes people get like mad at us because our opinions don't like match up with theirs. And yeah, I'm sorry. That's just not how the world works. You know, everyone has different, <laughs> different tastes and it's just how it goes. So for me, the, there, I had a couple of criteria. Number one for, you know, best games ever, um, it had to uh, a couple of things. So this is a pre 1920 pre 1920s. So it's like the Romantic era, um, leading into what I would call like the classical era with like Steinitz and Lasker and Tarash and um, at the start of the uh, the twentieth century. And um, for me, there was obviously a lot of like super flashy games back then and really nice uh, combinations and stuff. But uh, for a game to make it on my list, I, it had to show some kind of like really interesting like strategic concept um, in the game and have this like kind of like artistic element like a really nice attack or amazing combination or sacrifice or or something um, or something like that 
And uh, let me also just say it was actually really hard to do this, um, but also very enjoyable, like playing through these like classic games, um, actually kind of inspirational, just like how many amazing games there were like in this period, yeah. like and how many just incredible players i felt so bad leading leaving off some games <laughs> like oh, on this list yes. it's just like so so tough um but i'm super pumped that you guys want to like make videos on all the games because actually i feel like that, that would that would be, that's going to be such great um material anyway without further ado my number six game uh is the game capablanca marshall which i only remembered um just recently and this mm, was got the a great year story to it as well. 1918, I think. So yeah, 1918. So yes. Basically, this game was the original Marshall Gambit. Um, actually, I did put it. Uh, I did put it in. So I'm just going to quickly uh, play through for folks. Um, oh, there we go. All right, Jesse's already doing it. <laughs> so this was basically yeah the the first time I believe that the Marshall Gambit, the famous Marshall Gambit, that to this day is like one of the most theoretical, most like solid openings at the top level uh, was played by Frank Marshall. And, uh, you know, uh, Cabobanca like has to deal with this gambit like over the board. Uh, presumably Marshall was preparing this for years and waiting to spring yes. it uh, on someone. And yes. he, he was preparing to spring it only on Kappa. So he had mm. passed up the chance to play it against other players for years He'd been waiting to just not cop out once. That was the whole plan, the whole goal. It Incredible. was like, you know, a personal <laughs> nuke just for Kappa. I mean, really, yeah, just like fascinating. Marshall, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it was just like this incredible attacking player. I felt bad, actually. I don't have any of his games on my list, but he had some amazing games um, as well. And uh, yeah, he basically like made it everyone, you know, in just like crushing fashion. So he prepares this gambit for years and years. And then Cabobanca has to uh, face it over the board. And I mean, he like survives this vicious attack. So knight g4, I don't think white can take because queen h4 is coming. Um, so he has to defend and like really like difficult moves. <laughs> like white has to find it, like a lot of these positions. Um, like check here, black takes the rook, he goes bishop d2. And Cabobanca essentially like makes it Honestly, it makes it look easy. Like his king escapes um, over to the queen side and eventually he wins because of the the extra material. And uh, yeah, I just love like the story of this game. Um, obviously, Capablanca is an uh, amazing player. He had a lot of fantastic games. But this one, it's like, I mean, it must have been such a difficult effort. And uh, a recent game I was thinking about that compares to this was the game Ding Loren versus Caruana from the candidates. Where Caruana hit Ding with like, this crazy prep and Ding just like refuted it just over the board just beautifully. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Sorry for taking a little too long, yeah. but that's my, <laughs> that's my number, no, fine. number six. Yeah. Great game. And then it's just back to you. Okay. Um, number five. Um, let me get it ready in our list here. Um, this is the game. Uh, Shigorin Steinitz, 1892. So I believe this was in in their World Championship match. And um, let me show the game for everyone. So Shigorin Steinitz, they they played a bunch of games, and um, Shigorin uh, checkmated Steinitz many times. Um, but I've always really really loved this game so it starts off as uh as an evans gambit of course classic for this era uh, shigorin was a big big fan of this one and um the thing that i really like about shigorin's play uh in general was that like he really believed in the long-term initiative here he's just like down a pawn and he just like he's just like playing normal chess as if he's not down the pawn he's not like immediately trying to win anything back um and uh, i just love how he like develops the attack here, he has this like nice positional compensation with like the center and his pieces are a little bit better. Um, he brings knight in and then the starts playing on the a4 queen side. Idea. The knight c4a4 idea mm -hmm. is a positional idea used now in the very quiet Chioko pianos. 
right. uh, very, very modern way of trying to make progress. In those days, you know, you would expect someone to just plop their knight on C3 and not think too hard about it. Yeah, absolutely. Or like just like going after the king sign here, like A4, he's trying to uh, induce yeah. a weakness by like this threat of A5. So black goes C6. And then he gets this like d6 square and no it's actually very modern like i feel like nowadays we take this kind of play um for for granted um but i really think shigorn was just uh it's an incredible attacker um and then of course the game just has a really just incredible combination um knight d6 check is played king f8 white setting up here bishop a3 king g8 rook b1 just like another just including all the pieces in the attack um, yeah. Black goes knight of five, and then a high high class move, right? Preparing to put the rook on b seven with an a five pawn sack and preventing bishop c seven, challenging a knight. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, well, here here it comes the hammer. Knight takes f seven, king takes e six check. Queen can't take because of knight g five, so king takes. Blows are raining. Knight e five, yeah, comes and hit the queen. Queen c eight, and then just rook e one. I mean, it's just like it's so good and for me it's it's like i love i love real attacks you know like everyone likes a nice combination um that you know it's like queen sacrifice ends in a flashy check win and it's all forced but this is the kind of stuff that's really just like beautiful to me you just like sack a knight you put a knight on e5 and you say all right go play with your king on e6 <laughs> like, good good luck so king f6 and uh and the attack was finished off brutally B3 and um, it was soon all over. So yeah, that's my uh, number five game. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, at the end, anyone confused? Queen F5, Queen F8 is what he's setting up. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, thanks, Gosia. And I liked um, <clears throat> I liked how you presented sort of your your criteria and how you thought about this. I like it. One thing you said, which is that this has been just a fantastic week for me. I mean, one of the best weeks of my life. And I've had a kid <laughs> home sick and a baby up at night crying, and I've slept two hours a day. But no matter how tired I am, I just keep clicking through more of these old games every day and just absolutely loving it. Um, one of my main criteria. So for me, it's very art artistic. And I actually, this is an interesting point is. You know, last week we left some good players off the list of top 10 players of all time, right? Like there's some amazing players who we each must have had at 11 or 12 or 13, et cetera, right? I mean, it must have hurt Jesse a little bit to leave Smyslov off the list. Um, you know, it uh, you know, I would have I would have loved to see Mikhail Tall or right. or David Bronstein or somebody make the list. Um, but I almost but I think I felt even worse this week leaving some games off the list than people. And I think that shows just how much to me chess is kind of an art form. So it's like it's it's the aesthetic is so important to me. And uh, the games that I consider great, you know, I'm just I'm just in love with them. And uh, I think one of the main criteria in the games that I've included today is uh, replayability. If that makes sense. It's like a movie that you would watch 20 times. And honestly, there's more than 20 games here that I would replay, you know, five or 10 times. But there are some that, yeah, I mean, I could just I could probably just sit here for a year just replaying that one game and studying it. <laughs> so there's some really, really great material here. Uh, I think my number five game is Janowski Capablanca 1916. Let's put that in here. Yeah, actually, I, I consider this game for my list. Yeah. Um, and uh, should we do a little playthrough? Yeah, let me jump to it. On this game. And we're ready. I think this game is mildly famous for, uh, for one slightly complicated concept near the beginning of the game, uh, which is where Capablanca plays Bishop D7. All right, so I'll click a couple of moves. So it's this move here, Bishop D7. You know, because it was a great discovery that wasn't that old at that point that a bishop inside its pawn chain could be a bad piece, right? Um, and here he retreats the bishop to d7 um, because he knows that he wants to advance the b pawn. 
and the bishop is going to be necessary to do that. So it's kind of a, a, a two-piece strategic concept, right? It's understanding how to use the isolated B-pawns, and it's the idea that the plan is so important that you make your piece bad um, to do the plan. Um, so that's uh, a brilliant concept, and I think somewhat famous uh, from yeah. this game. If this game is, is known for something, it's probably mostly for that. I remember, yeah, seeing this move Bishop D7 when I was a kid. And honestly, I wasn't impressed back then. I was like, oh, wow, Bishop D7, you know, <laughs> amazing move. But now I look yeah. at it and I'm like, wow, I would like, I would be, it would be so hard to play this move in a game, like moving your Bishop a second time, you know, like. Yeah. And if your Bishop were on D7 here and you were playing like a Blitz game, the first thing you might consider would be Bishop F5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To play E6, Bishop E7 and Castle or something, right? So. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty fantastic. Now, I will say for my rankings of the top games, I wouldn't have put this game in the top five just for this, just for one single concept. That's not enough for me. I need the game to sort of have something, you know, epic about it as well. So I'll play through some more moves and I'll, I'll point out one or two other things I like um, beyond this. Um, I like that he expands on the king side as well. Would have even loved to see. Yeah, um, h6 and g5, uh, which will come. And then here's another move I really like, Kostya. When e4 gets played, I've, I've played a, you know, a, a decent number of blitz games in positions like this. And I love that he just backs up the king mm -hmm. and leaves room to rearrange the bishop. It's like you don't know whether to take on e4 or let them take on d5 or what to do. He just, just relax, keep squares for the pieces. Right. And then he plays two sides with the bishop pair. Um, G5, very important. Now, in some other game, he pushed uh, G4 and then H5, H4, etc. But in this game, he correctly judges that he can take over the G file fast enough with the knight on E1. Um, so that's very nice. And then there's this pawn sack to get the D7 bishop into the game, which is... After this, obviously, White's defenses are cracked, but I really like that as well. And finally, he executes this endgame really, really precisely here, sacking the bishop on e7. And the technique here is not necessarily easy, but he makes it look slightly easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, right, just walks the king away <laughs> as he delivers the checkmate. Um, one thing also... Um... Kind of related to the dojo training program. Well, I don't know where we're going to keep the book, but a book we had before at some of the higher cohorts was um, Yermolinsky's Road to Chess Improvement. And this, it's really, he has a really interesting whole chapter on this game. And what's fascinating about it is just useful for people to think about best games in general, is this game has been held in reverence for the longest time. And Yermo just rips it apart. <laughs> Yermo just totally rips it apart. And in a funny way, he doesn't even take every move. It's not like he's doing every move. He's just like, let's take a look at a couple of these decisions. And it's a really interesting investigation into concepts we hold in reverence. And then, mm -hmm. you know, games also we hold in reverence. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's some really interesting points that Yermo gets into here where we're just like, what? <laughs> what yeah. are we talking about? <laughs> I was kind of reflecting this week, like right as he goes knight a5 and prepares uh -huh. knight c4, I thought I saw several opportunities for white to not let the game just sort of flow so easily. Um, oh, there's definitely some opportunities, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so then for my number... Five. It's a hard list. I'll say maybe a couple little bit of how I was thinking about it. Um, the game has to speak to my aesthetic sense, but also I find that, especially from this time period, uh, best games are a little bit like memes in the sense that people of that period um, and beyond gravitated towards them in some kind of uh, they held some kind of magnetic attraction that's still true for modern games but especially for games of this period i think there was a kind of a cult around several of the games that we are going to look at and so just the appreciation of this time period is a little different from appreciation of other time periods mm -hmm. where it's kind of yeah there's kind of cult of let's call it genius or cult of imagination and chess fantasy and chess 
Mm-hmm. And so my list reflects not only my personal sense, I think, but the games of that time that fascinated uh, that generation. In any so case, for you, so, was it a yeah. for you was it a good or a bad thing if a particular game fascinated people? Oh yeah, no, it has to be like a meme like quality. It had to have penetrated okay. like the consciousness of that time. right. Um, okay, so my number five is this very famous game, Anderson Kizaritsky. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh, excuse me, wrong game. The immortal game. <laughs> Anderson Kizaritsky, right? So let's get into it. One rant I have that I think is hilarious, and this came out of me doing the review of Modern Ideas in Chess by Reddy, was Reddy and Capablanca both felt in the 1920s that opening theory had progressed too much. It had gone too far and they needed to do something like Fisher Random. And these guys too, they really felt, they really felt like the King's Gambit was the only way to play chess. And so they went deep, deep into these lines. And we see like the, the move yeah. B5 might look weird to people, but that's the move of somebody who's like, well, I got to stop the initiative of this dude. Let me, Sorry, let me tell you, can one... you just um show the first few moves again? Just yeah. We weren't on the board. Let me make one crazy point about that, Jesse. Yesterday, Mm -hmm. I was looking at this Morphe game Mm -hmm. that that he won, and uh, he against against Anderson, I think. And then it turned out he'd won the same variation from from the black side two months before with a different sixteenth move. You know, yeah, know or, sorry, with, with with his opponent playing a different 16th move, and he played a 16th move improvement against Anderson from the white side. So Morphe yeah. won the same position from white and from black. It was a 16 move variation, and it's this kind of you know madness king's gambit. You're like, why does black have a knight on h1 on move five? Right? Uh, like, yeah. like what <laughs> what has white done? And Morphe won from both sides of it, but 16 moves. I mean, that's yeah. not the amount of theory we expected that they had back then. And I've told this story before, but one of my favorite discoveries at like the chess wandering chess bookshop that often features antiquarian books is I found this three tome collection from eight, the 1890s on the featured really the King's Gambit. Three tomes, just lines of the King's Gambit too, <laughs> going super deep and like with a scientific tone. Okay. With a scientific mm-hmm. tone. That's okay. Funny. So um, what I has, I suspect I'm not going to be the only one to have this game on the list. But what's there's a lot of things that are interesting about this, um, but especially, I guess, the aesthetics of the following business. So the knight is threatening knight to g3, and then this is a very odd move. And it's using the fact that the bishop on b5 is pinning the d7 pawn so that we will get our knight to f5. So knight comes to f5, and it still looks great for black. It seems like we're getting popped around. And then boom! Very surprising. Very surprising <laughs> move, dude. G4, Very. yeah. This this game has one of the highest percentages ever of surprising moves, right? Of any game. <laughs> <laughs> Even from both players, but but certainly from Anderson. I mean, yeah. Ooh. So, and then we get another one. Boom! We're threatening h four. So there it comes, and we're saying, "Boss, I'm going to take the f three f four pawn." One of the features of these King's Gambit games, by the way, is like obviously you got to win the pawn back, and then winning it back is oftentimes the end of the story. <laughs> even, even after losing the light squared bishop. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Beautiful. Amazing. Take my business. It's rough. It's about to get real, my friends. Boom. Check the miserable king. Mate. Yeah. And I think a lot of these games, um, one of the things that's interesting, especially let's say of Anderson and Morphe, is there's often uh, of, of the really great games an economy of force, right? So like it's about mate, and it's not about how many pieces you have left on the board, boss. Mm-hmm. Um, and revolutionary for the time, but also still very beautiful. Also still very beautiful. Oh, okay, yeah. so that's my number. 
Uh, yeah, five. it's now a I- it's a pure checkmate and almost a pure board because he almost doesn't have any pieces that are not part of the pure checkmate. Like, it's it's an aesthetic advantage that every single other piece has been captured for him. <laughs> and I guess yeah. I go again here, huh? Um, yeah. Well, let me just say I, I think it's just yeah. like an amazing game. One detail people might not know is that um, remember in the analysis um. Someone pointed out, I think it was like Steinitz or someone from that area was like that um, Black should have played queen takes Mm -hmm. a one check here. Yes. Um, And then after king e2, I think the best defense is like queen b2 back. Mm -hmm. And and then they're saying that like, okay, if Black had done this, Black would have been like, Black would have been defending, or Black would have been would have been fine. Um, but I was actually checking this game recently, like with like modern engines. Yeah, and it's like Anderson's like sack or his play is actually like, I mean, it's it's very it's actually very strong. <laughs> like uh, it's it's kind of amazing. Um, like his idea is so deep that the engine doesn't even recognize that White is winning at first glance which Mm -hmm. is um to me i I just thought that was that was so cool that you could play a game hard in 1850 (laughs) he's down so much material but there's a really strong positional basis for it because i think it's hard to imagine a position where your opponent has protected outposts on d5 and d6 as white and black's doing okay like that's (laughs) White is, white is completely paralyzed black. There's this D7, D6, D5 thing in the middle of his camp where he can't move any pieces. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just like, it's just wild. Um, so like one point is that, so here like white plays bishop takes C5. And I think if you let the engine run long enough, it actually, yeah, it just says like white is winning. Um, also in this position after uh, bishop takes G1, if black had played here, then white goes e5 and and so my computer like it's very strong running like stockfish 15.1 neural net like it takes like a couple seconds to actually realize okay e5 actually white's winning (laughs) and and i remember like checking this game like back in the day with like some older engines and it's like they thought they thought black was winning here and so that's just like insane to me that i don't know you you could just do that (laughs) like 18 it really shows anderson's um anderson's genius i think but anyway um, I I expect someone else will have that on their list. So probably we'll come back to it too. And I guess I go again here, huh? Yeah. Number four from Jesse. Number four is a different flavor of game. This is going to be the famous Rote Levy Rubinstein. And I don't know if I'm going to flip it from, uh, I don't know if it's going to flip up there. But uh, just my sense is this is in a lot of ways, one of the first, let's, I don't, know, I don't use, I don't know if I like the word scientific, but um, let's call it, for the sake of it, scientific counterattacks. So imagine um, the art of defense is something that is developed by Steinitz and then the whole next coming generations um, and showing that the romantic school is at least, it's not as easy as they sometimes make it look. And this game has a fantastic conception, but also um, I think it's very principled and I'll talk about it a little bit. So, um, okay, queen d2 is a mildly strange move. Now, doesn't seem like the worst thing ever, but it's these little details that are gonna end up hurting white. So the first thing we'll say is black is up in time. And then that's a beautiful move just to open up the bishop on b7. And white says, bows. <laughs> white says, bows. I can play f4 here. And I can get away with it. Rook a c8. And when you look at the position now, what's interesting about this benign looking rook a c8 move is white is making a bold claim about the central pawns and their value here. Right. And rook a c8, I'm going to say we're going to look at the combination that comes, but I think it's already kind of baked in 
to the position here. Okay, so here we go. Pop, the most natural move. Check to the miserable king. And pop. All right, so the bishop, the key to see is the bishop on d3 is hanging. Key to see is that our rooks are developed before black's rooks. Okay, white says no big deal, Bob's bishop b4. Okay, mating threat. And now this really, this cracker here. Bam! Beautiful move, Bob's. Beautiful move. <laughs> GH, come on, baby, let's go. Yeah. What a move, boss. What a move. And then it's going to be mate, my friends. What a mm. great game. Mm. Incredible. And Jesse, go back a moment with the rooks on D2 and C3. I was just thinking, it's kind of nice for black that the bishops are covering D8 and C8. Because if not, you know, white might have some kind of counter shot like rook D1 in some of these positions. Fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But somehow the bishops are killing the white king and they're covering the back rank mate on both open files. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it's not quite true because on rook ad1, I just played bishop e4, queen. Bishop e4 and rook h2 rook is H2. already, yeah. But yes, it's true. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, so economy of force, but this new way where we're going to use very small advantages to turn, uh, you know, into something big into a romantic idea like this. And these bishops, we're going to see configurations like this for the next many decades, even today, of uh, very spicy counter counterplay. Yeah. And there's an insane modern game, um, Aronian Anand, which I think takes some inspiration from this one. Okay, here. yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Sure. Right? I think this, I think this Rubenstein game one one of the things it does is it sort of births the whole way of playing, right? Like this guy taught us how to play the Moran defense and a whole range of um, Queen's Gambit symmetrical positions like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I ranked this game, I think it was number eight on my list. Um, just because for me, I thought it's like an incredible combination, but it was kind of a short game, you know? A, a great game for like a game to memorize, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I felt like I couldn't quite rank it higher because it wasn't like enough. It wasn't enough struggle for me. You know, it was just like very quick and and over. Um, there was a couple. I just want to say there's a couple of suggestions people had like of games that I just think like are really good combinations, but for me are not like amazing games. Like the game um, Lasker Bauer gets mentioned a lot of like best games of all time. The double bishop mm -hmm. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, it's a great sacrifice. Like, whatever. I, I don't know why it's like, you know, to me, just, uh, well, I try, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but it's like, yeah, it just doesn't stack up to some of these, like, other games. But anyway. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a difference between the best games to use for memorizing and the absolute greatest games. A lot of times, my favorite games are going to be longer, and the games that I would recommend people to memorize are going to be a little bit more simple and one-sided. Um. However, I did also rank this game fourth, just like Jesse. Oh, wow. Um, Solid. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's my You guys only... got to input it on your list, by the way. You gotta I've already done in. that. Don't worry. Oh, there we go. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I think it's my only really, you know, just smacking one-sided beatdown uh, that I used in my top couple games here. So, yeah. Um, yeah, to me, you know, as we mentioned, the sh the sheer brilliance of it, the the use of the small tempo, the the way the the whole and that it sort of teaches you how to play a whole set of openings. Um, this one's pretty special, and the variations are super artistic, right? It's like these are the kind of positions you would put up on your wall, and just you'd wake up in the morning and see it and feel good. Yeah. Anyway, it's on to you, Costia, for number four. Okay. Um, all right. My number four game is, let me make sure I get this right. Give us something good. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Yeah. I remember what it is. Let me just check, uh, check the year. Um, real classic. I think you guys might have this on your list as well. Um, good example of a game that I think is like pretty brilliant, but not a great game to memorize. Um, Lasker Capablanca 1914. 
Ooh, baby. So this is, let me um, switch over to our board here. I think this is known as like the famous uh, Spanish exchange game where uh, Lasker plays the uh, Rui Lopez, takes on C6 against Cabo Blanca, goes into the end game against uh, the legend. And um, there's a couple moments in this game that are famous. Overall, I would just say it's just an incredibly well-played end game. Um, this first moment here after F6, white goes F5, which uh, checks out, you know, top line, best move. Um, restricting the bishop on c8. And um, a move that even today I think looks incredibly anti-positional. I think even a lot of very strong players would reject this kind of move in similar positions because it gives up the e5 square, which looks like a square that black can use. Um, but okay, last square is understood further. He's going to trade off the dark squared bishops and it's really all about restricting the, um, the light squared bishop here. So that's kind of the first decision that is really solid. And uh, he continues the grind gets the knight to to e6 and to me one of the you know more amazing things about this game is that he's doing this uh to capa blanca you know he's out capping kappa uh, and just like totally squeezing him in this end game um just perfect like sherevsky style end game strategy play here like playing on both sides of the board not rushing um and then the next breakthrough comes at uh, this moment with e5, it's very nice. Sherashevsky probably got the idea for his whole book from this game. He probably saw this game <laughs> and was like, oh, oh, I should write a book. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, this game just, yeah, just deserves um, to be shown. So e5, very nice, just clearing the e4 square for the knight, um, an idea that was introduced by the great Philidor, who was very influential. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And then just like the domination here, I mean, it's just like... I agree. Lasker knew his classics. He learned from the best. Yeah. In I mean, order it's to just, surpass them. I, I think if this was against a lesser player, I would probably rank this game lower. But because it was just like in such a strong like positional genius like Kappa, it's just, yeah, to me, it's um, quite extraordinary. And uh, yeah, my number, my number four game. Let me just say that B4 move was really sick as well in this mm -hmm. game. Very, very nice restraint move. I, I think was... I think Nimzovich learned something from that move. <laughs> <laughs> Included it in his in his systems. Actually, there's a funny game where where Capablanca beats Nimzovich, and like in the comments, they're like, I think Nimzovich like learned all all the ideas from my system from this game. <laughs> Cause Kappa does all of it to him. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is this is probably the worst loss of uh, of Capablanca's life. One of the most thorough, just yeah, beatings. And um, I've I've got it ranked even higher than you, so it'll come up again. Nice. Okay. So then I'll go to my number three pick, um, which is a very famous game. Needs no introduction. It's uh, the opera game, Morphe. First, I'm just going to write the Duke. Um, or should I write? I don't know. Uh, whatever. Morphe. <laughs> uh, what was what was the year on this one? You guys remember? 1858? Mm. He, play, he played every single one of his games in 1858. Great. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, okay. This game needs a uh, little introduction obviously i think most people have have seen the opera game uh, it's one of the first games we often show in like kids classes because it's just like so instructive and just demonstrates um so many just like fundamental chess truths about development and initiative and and the balance of you know material versus um versus development in particular um just perfect game like start to finish um every move is uh, is just perfect <laughs> and elegant. And someone on Twitter, I think, was trying to tell me that like Queen B3 in this position was more accurate than Bishop C4. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? Anyway, uh, beyond that uh, blemish, um, just uh, incredible game. Obviously features this knight sacrifice on, on B5, 
or white sacrifices a piece first, just continues beautifully, sacrifices the rook on d7 to keep the incredible um, pin alive, brings a second rook in. Um, just a fantastic concept here, just the fact that he's trading off one of his attackers for one of Black's defenders, and then bringing in another attacker when Black can't do um, the same. And of course, the finish is, uh, is pretty immortal um, as well. Um, so yeah, uh, incredible game. I think Morphe had a lot of fantastic games, so obviously a lot could go, but I think this is just kind of, for me, this is his like his crown jewel. It's the one that's just like so perfect and elegant. It's just like chess in its purest form. If you had to like just show like the romantic era uh, in like one game, maybe this would be the game that I would pick. Um, but uh, okay, yeah, it's only number three for me. It's like pre-1920, you know, it's, it's a lot of years. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a lot of time. So um, yeah, I thought about ranking it higher, but I don't know. This is where this is where it goes for me. Yeah, a uh, fantastic well, game. But um, slightly surprised because you said you didn't want you, that you didn't value as highly normally games that were very one sided. Um, which, which this one was. Um, I have a favorite Morphe game that that is a different one, um, which I think we've mentioned. But okay, number three, and and I'm gonna say more about this game later. So all right, Dave, what do you got? Number three, okay. Um, I've got Alyechin, Lasker. I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you guys the whole game. <laughs> All right. But, uh, but let's get a part of it. So this is played in the exact same tournament as the game that Kostya just showed. Um, Lasker, Capablanca, uh, just a couple days apart. Um, oh, the wrong game. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong game. My bad. Sorry, that's the tournament you mentioned. No, that's fine. While you're looking that up, is St. Petersburg, nineteen fourteen. I, I want. I thought I clicked on the right one. I tried to click on the one where he's white. Lasker. Okay, I got it now. Nope, this is wrong as well. Well, we can come back to it if you want to grab it. All right, I'll I'll get it right eventually. I'll just take take two seconds. Okay, here we go. Okay, so within a couple days, Lasker beats Alyechin and Capablanca on the two sides of the exchange <laughs> Rui, right? Like the two best players other than him in the world. And uh, yeah, beats the, beats them back to back from both sides of the same opening. So was this game second or did it come first? This game came first, mm. and then a couple rounds later, the game against Capablanca. Um, so, um, so I say Alyechin was not yet at his full powers in this tournament, right? He was still a bit younger than uh, than Lasker and Kappa. Um, but uh, he's already he's already a bit a bit a bit tricky and a bit feisty um but uh lasker's so so he's chasing the same dark squared bishop trade and this maneuver of the knight to h4 was really was really pesky by lasker i like it he managed to find play over here on the king's side against uh against white's pawn majority here a little bit which is um you know an underpinning of how the berlin defense is played now right you sort of mess with the opponent's pawn majority a little bit harry the pawns um and uh he yeah he walks into this f4 move with the the g3 fork backs up gets forked gives up his bishop pair doesn't put his knight on e5 like just what <laughs> hard hard to understand then we go into these tactics aliakin tries to break down the d file with bishop takes b6 and 
here he starts throwing a queenside attack with very, very minimal pieces on the board. And uh, yeah, I mean, all these moves, I struggled to understand. I played through the game again and again. Um, but B4 so that you can open a file with A4. Okay, I'll get him gets rid of the backward pawn. He comes over here, threatens knight c3, pawn takes, pawn takes, rook a1 mate. Knight c4. This move here was phenomenal, I think, as well. H6. Um, obviously, he's played this little pawn sack on b3. But this h6 move to keep his king from getting cramped and squished is a very cool um, endgame concept, right? That if once white plays g5, then you can't really avoid... Um, you can't ever play g6 or h6 yourself anymore once white gets the pawn to g5. So your king just sort of gets squished there. So he plays h6 to prevent that, even though it provides a hook for white to counterattack his king. And... Uh, the position is still very, very close to equal throughout this. Um, and here he's got a very cool idea, knight d5, moving the knight away from the king, but it hits the rook when it doesn't have a great square to go to, and then uh, follows up with rook d3 with the knight c3 check threat. And white's rook is basically trapped over there. Um he has also the threat of rook d1 and knight e3. So white had to give up an exchange. And then the following um the following phase here is they get this rook and knight versus two rook endgame on one side of the board. And um Lasker basically demonstrates from what I can understand, from what I've read, the perfect method for winning this endgame which I think even today lots of people would fail to win this end game as black. Certainly me, but I mean like better players yeah. <laughs> would still fail to win this. It is an epic undertaking, um, but he eventually does it. I mean, there's no way we can do it proper justice here, but what he wants to do is try and force a rook trade by tying the rook to the knight. to tie the rook to the knight, He needs his rooks to not be connected. Right. Mm -hmm. so that white has to defend the placement of the rook but mm -hmm. to then offer the rook trade he has to then reconnect the rooks so you see that it's a very very difficult undertaking so he's going to put one rook like this the knight's going to come back to its best square Moves the king back off of the area where the other rook is so that he can eventually bring it over here. So white, every time you threaten rook d1, rook d2, white has to come out. And finally, the knight will be traded. And here, I'll get him resigned. Wow. All right. I love it um squeezes something out of nothing very very i mean it's got tricky tactics it's it's uh got deep strategy tricky tactics then a long 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 grind um he uses everything on the board and uh honestly you know magnus could play this game nowadays and you would say that was a great game like this is this is a game you would still be impressed to see somebody play now in my opinion Yeah, no, honestly, I hadn't seen that game before. At least definitely not in any kind of detail. Uh, but yeah, it seems like a super high level game. Yeah, and one which, right, for one of my criteria, you could play over this game many, many, many times and keep keep learning from it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it probably wouldn't, it wouldn't match jesse's it has to be a meme criteria which i think is actually really yeah. interesting because i didn't think about it yeah. like that but it yeah, totally yeah. makes sense and a lot of the games that we remember are specifically because um 
they were famous at the time, like the the story of like the gold coins and, and that kind of thing. Right. I looked up the gold coin game and, uh, you know, the intro to the Queen G3 move is not particularly worthy of being on our best game yeah. lists, even that move, even though that move itself is amazing. I mean, for one thing, he's just up a piece in the position where he plays Queen G3. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, what Jesse said about like the meme games is very interesting because I... Uh, you know, one thing that I love about this area is they they took this very seriously. What was the best game and, and all that, right? Brilliancy prizes were a big deal. People took it really seriously. All these tournaments had brilliancy prizes. When someone played a really great game, some of the other players would not submit their games for consideration for the best game prize because that other game was so good as a kind of like, you know, everybody had to have proper, you know, it was like prop being properly religious, right? Like you had to mm -hmm. properly respect, you know, mm -hmm. Kaisa's altar. So, yeah. okay, cool. Let's funny. let's approach Kaisa's altar then. All right. <laughs> so my number three is this game. Um, it's really fascinating to me. Um, this one uh, of all the Morphe games is not often listed, but I think it's because it's so beautiful and complicated there's some stuff going behind the scenes that i have not looked with the computer i've refused but it it's going to get pretty real okay so let's go over here by the way one piece of good dojo news is with starting david said that morphe was in 1900 he's moved it to 2100 <laughs> and i think after we look at some of the ideas in this game we he might even decide that morphe is better than a 2100 we'll see Okay, now, as we said, these King's Gambit games, they were religious about this opening. Right? Let me say something about Morphe and, and the ratings and the <laughs> and the religious games. Let me just point out something. Yeah. Because it's so long ago, people generally only look at Morphe's like greatest hits. They don't look at all his games, you know, in the same way that they do for more recent players. Uh-huh. Are you going to just people, dig the hole deeper, boss? Is that what you're going to That's do? all I'm going to say. People play through like his top <laughs> five games. They play through his top five games, you know, greatest hits, you know, whatever. And then they're like, wow, that's like amazing, right? But everybody has some greatest hits and some less good games. I could show you like, you know, my top five games and, and it would look like this. Okay, you're, boss. You're a bit higher than 2100, David. I, I'm a bit <laughs> higher. My top five games definitely better than Morphe's top five oh, games. No, but anyway, go on. It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> all right david i com command silence for just a, a minute or two okay so here we go so this position well, maybe... let me switch to the game one second oh sorry 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 okay um, back. so i think you gotta you didn't enter it on the sheet yet or at least i don't oh it's Let's there see. i'm on there it's number two and i'm i'm moving the pieces no no on the on the google sheet oh i'm sorry so this is uh morphe anderson 1858 as we've said before, problem solving games repeat. <laughs> <laughs> this is when Morphe travels to Europe, 1858, right before the Civil War is going to break out. Okay. So, um, Tommy, right, when go ahead. are you on the board? Yeah. There we yeah. go. Okay. So, as we said, this King's Gambit stuff was high theory. All right. Here we go. Pop, pop. Oh my gosh. Pop, pop. Now, maybe this is like something, I'm, probably this is something both players had studied. So mm. here's the thing. When I One of the reasons I picked this game is it's the madness is going to start here. And I think in order to play this move, you got to see uh, what's coming. So, so you, there's some heavy calculation here and also just big attacking idea. So here we go. D3. This is where I'm like, boss, I think it's might be more than a 2100. So I'm going to show the game, then we're going to back up a little bit. But I'm going to say mm -hmm. this is the critical decision here. D3. I know you wanted me to be okay. silent, Jesse, but this was theory at the time. Sorry. Okay, but it, whether it's theory or not, it's not like they're doing it with a computer. So here mm -hmm. we go. Check to the miserable king. Now we're going to come back to the knight h1 decision. And then we get this very nice pop. And then we're winning. Now let's go back a second because where it gets really hot is then evaluating a queen e7 check. And so I just want to say <laughs> for my for my uh, 
you know, mind, which is not at Morphe's mind, this is, it breaks my head. Now, the problem with queen e7 is, let's say we, we got to put the king somewhere, that the queen b4 check is really annoying. King f2, this is really annoying. It's, it's annoying partially because this bishop is going to be hanging. So let me just say I've spent some time on this with my human mind. I think white is still okay, but it's amazingly deep. And of course, the game yeah. itself is deep with taking the rook. But then this is like this is like my big question: like what's happening here, boss? Uh, so I just wanted to say like this is an example of where you're seeing like I don't know. I, I don't even want to put a rating on it, but you're you're seeing like really deep coordination of pieces and in addition to like this very modern thing we have coordination of pieces plus intuitive decisions so 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 tactics plus uh, a sense of the game plus intuition of the initiative and how it works so yeah this is my number three morphy anderson 1858 that's insane it's really hard to figure out what to do about queen e7 off the top of my head i would guess that the line is something like King F2, knight H1, king G1, queen H4, G3, knight G3, queen E1, king D8, bishop G3, queen G4, bishop H3. But it's it's really hard to say. <laughs> yeah, and let's just say that this is one of the floating little ideas. This is another one. Okay, so I don't want to go too deep. I just wanted to say that was uh, above the level of 2100, my friend. Okay, mm -hmm. so... <laughs> yeah. um, by the way, we just let's just rejoice at the chess dojo for a second. We don't have any Philidor games on the list, you know. No. So we're just this, you know, we got to celebrate the small victories that we There's get. Two in spots life. left. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> this was so, a good choice, Jesse. This is a this is a competitive and, and interesting game. This okay. one here. So Jesse, you yeah. like this one more than. Um, I think actually it was against Paulson, but do you know the game Morphe Paulson? That's like, it's kind of like a Sicilian. There's a lot of great like... Mor Morphe games. Um, I chose that one because there was like one decision and it breaks my head. And I was just like, yes, okay, I, I understand. I understand the, the, the level of depth that we're talking about uh, mm -hmm. here. Yeah. I might change my mind. Like I'm sure if we did this list in a couple of years or two, I might change my mind. Yeah. Um, number it's two. You for number two. Yeah. And number two is I'm going for Steinitz versus Barta Lehman. And I'll say a couple words about this. Um, I was recently reminded of this game because uh, I'm rereading all the books for the dojo training program. And one of those is Vukovic's Art of Attack, which he talks about this game. Also helped me understand why this was a meme game or a game that was celebrating its time for the way it was played. Let me just say a couple things about it. Okay, first of all, very competitive. This is also theory at the time. Um, D5, actually a very um, modern move to play D5, to not take on E4. And then here we go. This is still honestly theory. So um, pop, 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 rookie one. F6 is a very strong move from a positional sense because we are now going to be dominating the knight on F3. Okay. So now queen e7, queen e7 makes sense. Looks like black's about to consolidate. Rook ac1. Okay. Big questions are being asked. Black plays the natural c6, and now the first really elegant move of this game, d5. And this is a beautiful strategic idea that I guess we call now square clearance, where not only, well, one of the things I really enjoy about it is white really has one strategic problem in this position, and that's the fact that the knight on f3 isn't working. And so now we're going to give the pawn. Black, by the way, is, is close to just being strategically better. If we give black the move king f7, he's going to be doing great. So it's d5, knight d4, mm. and now this move, knight e6. Mm. And I, from my analysis of this, I, from my human analysis, I didn't turn on the computer. I think it's over. And then we, we, I don't want to go too deep into it. 
but I'll just show the idea here. We talked about this recently. We were talking about best players. Check to the miserable king. And now the problem it has is there's a back rank problem if I move my E1 rook. So here we go. We looked at this briefly. I'm not going to go spend too long. King takes, we take the queen with check. Queen takes, we take on C8. Bam, same thing. And then this is where the resignation happens. This is where dude rage quit. <laughs> dude just lost it and left the room. One of the reasons it's a, a, a meme game is because dude just totally loses it here. Apparently, there's some historical doubts on, on that story when we were talking about it. I saw people uh, posting on Twitter. It's like, it's not clear if he stormed off or if he politely resigned and left. <laughs> no, nah, he stormed off, dog. That's, that's like, you know, that's well known. <laughs> yeah, sure. Ah, well known. <laughs> So a beautiful aesthetic finish and also a, like a key modern strategic idea with the square clearance with D5. That's my number mm -hmm. two. Yeah, clearance sack. Learned it from uh, somebody really, really good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that I uh, just want to say great game. Um, and Sorry, what do I what do I want to say on this one? Yeah, like just like the the counterattack with like the rook on C against the rook on C one. That's I think also makes this game very very special. Um, just like yeah, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't like a totally one sided combination. Like Black also had some had some X clams in there, which is cool. Yeah, the opponent the opponent participated actively. It's good. Um. Yeah. Great game. Um, my number two uh, is Costa's number four, Lasker Capablanca, 1914. Um, that very thorough uh, Rui Lopez exchange with the knight on e6. The somewhat surprising f4, f5 move. Um, and uh, yeah, you can you can continue, Costa. <laughs> yeah, I already I already showed the game, so. Um... We'll we'll move on. Um, actually, while I'm doing my my next two, if you guys could maybe start compiling the games on the right side, I have some some space. We could start uh, tallying the scores up. Um, but uh, yeah, my number two game is the um, Immortal game, Anderson Kizaritsky. Uh, that was Jesse's number five pick. Um, for me, I put a number two. Honestly, if uh, this list could look very different in a week or last week, you know, just depending on if I had lunch or not. Um, I think my top three games, honestly, could uh, could all be flipped around. But um, yeah, for me, the Immortal game is just like so creative. Um, I'll just put the you know this position on, or um, you know, especially after this like concept of like Queen F three and. Just like sacrificing a piece but dominating black's pieces yeah to me this game is a little bit more imaginative than like the opera game a little bit more creative although both are extremely fantastic and, and elegant um but uh yeah uh yeah i don't know i i could it could go either way but for me i don't know i just like this one a bit a bit more it's just like a little bit uh a little bit fancier and yeah um also you know you guys are saying you didn't really check these games with the engines, I, I think that's actually kind of part of like the, the beauty, like if a game like holds up over time, you know, as Kasparov said, the test of time, like to me, that's incredible that these guys like essentially like discovered like truths about the game or like, you know, they conducted like little mathematical proofs of, you know, where they like refute like bad openings. And it's just like, I don't know. I think that's amazing that, that a lot of their stuff just like holds up with, with computers. I mean, I think it just shows their, their genius. Um, but anyway, that's my number two. Yeah. And uh, my number one game, uh, best games, pre-1920. It, it wasn't an obvious pick for me, but I realized, I don't know, this is, uh, I think this is the top game for me. It's um, the Battle of Hastings, Steinitz von uh, Bartleben. Uh, I just think it's such an elegant game. I guess I'll, I'll put it, I'll show it again. We, we just, we, I'll just put uh, the key key position on um uh 
Yeah, it's like a like really good opening from Steinitz and this move D5. I mean, it's just like, oh man, what a move. It's just so satisfying. And just the whole idea just bringing the knight to E6 and then everything just like flows beautifully. Um, and this game is really um, truly a work of art. Uh, no questions, I think, whether this game is like legit or, you know, some of the games, you know, might have been like composed back then, like who knows, but <laughs> this game like totally legit, tons of witnesses. And uh, yeah, for me, it's just like, Probably one of the best combinations of all time, starting with the brick takes e7. Um, like we mentioned, not just because it's like a fantastic combination, but also because black had this like king f8 resource, where, like every piece is hanging and white can take the queen and it's like back rank. And, um, you know, if, if if something was slightly different, this combination could have just been losing for white because of the back rank issue. But it just all works out so beautifully, like rook f7, rook g7, all the tactics are perfect, like all the details, king f8, knight takes h7, just everything about this game, I don't know, I think is just uh, just flawless. So, yeah, my number one game. Agreed. Flawless. We've got a lot of sort of flawless games here. Um, my number one is not a flawless game, so... <laughs> I don't know how, how anyone's going to feel about it, but whatever, I like this game. It is uh, Alaska versus Aljechen number nine in our list. Mm -hmm. An Alvin counter gambit. Oh, this game. Really, okay. really boss, dude? Man. <laughs> Every time you like to just do some weird thing for your top choice, Bob. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Pascal Alkine, 1914. Yeah. A good year for chess. Mainly yeah, because they played a I've 60, really... mainly because they played a 60 round tournament for like three months in St. Petersburg. <laughs> 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 they managed to get all the best players in the world into, and to stay in one place for three months. So that means our show is the best games from 1858 and 1914. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Sometimes chess really has good years. Like 1990 um, was a good year for chess players to be born. Um, anyway, um, okay. What I like about this game is actually that it's not flawless. That it is uh, really back and forth and... Uh, wild and that both players participate wholly in the game so let me show you up to a certain point in the opening so al Yekin is obviously pushing things by playing the uh alban counter gambit but um that is something that al Yekin did for chess i believe is he played some really bad well he played some openings that were not S tier. <laughs> he really helped explore <laughs> some areas. Okay. Lasker basically refutes his opening very nicely here. Um, given that this was sort of exploratory, but basically, you know, with his H3 and G3 Bishop G2 approach, this is one of the most modern approaches to the Alban counter gambit, right? Also with the early A3. True. And he makes no attempts to hold this e5 pawn. He just says, sure, you can take it back at some point, and bishop g2 is going to rule, right? And now he sends the c pawn up the board. And it basically, you know, he's just blind pushing the c pawn. And to me, it looks like black's toast. I don't know about you guys, but like you get to this point and you know, it could be a miniature. It could be just a <laughs> whatever, what's Black doing? And uh, it could have been a very one-sided game, and that could have been the end there. He could have played some kind of combination to checkmate Alyechin on the light squares. But Alyechin, here's the first most shocking thing, or the second shocking thing about the game, is that Black actually still turns this into a game. So you could say, oh, that means, you know, Lasker doesn't play the most precise move somewhere here, but... Um, first, he overprotects his D-pawn. Then he launches the F-pawn and finds a way to poke Lasker's dark squares because Lasker has played H3. 
earlier on. And, uh, you know, moves the knight away from his king. And boom! Oh! Mm -hmm. It's on. It's on. No walk in the park for, for Lasker here. Man, Alakon could play, huh? Yeah, look at the power of that of that overprotection, right? If anyone wants to argue about Nimsevich's theories, like this overprotected D pawn is shining right here. Blam with the knight. Queen e4 overprotecting b7 pawn. Yeah, queen e4 sure? overprotecting b7. <laughs> I mean, I. I don't know. Maybe he's trying to threaten something like rook takes c7, king takes c7, b8 or something at some yeah, point, exactly. right? Like, yeah, yeah. um, maybe. yeah, or or maybe rook a5 might be more mating. Like rook c7 might get ignored. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, so takes the rook here, develops this knight c3. Now I believe there's some analysis showing that knight f2 would draw for Alyekin. It doesn't spoil the game for me in any way. Um, to me, it's like amazing that Alyekin got it to this kind of crazy point. And um, here comes knight c3 attacking his queen. He just leaves the queen hanging. Um, goes and and uh, ravages the king side. The queen sack was sound. Yeah, there's a mate threat on c7. Well, it's not quite mate because knight e4 defend like blocks the b7. Oh. oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. But um yeah, I mean then he'll have bishop takes e4 check and on king c8, bishop e5 discovery. On king a6, rook a5. Mm -hmm. Mate, I think. Um so we get here, and by the way, now it's still sort of like close, right? He sacked an exchange, he won his exchange back. Aims for a better end game. The game continues. Aldiakian is still struggling against his fate. Um, but since the end games are in favor of Lasker, he can kind of bully him with trade offers in the middle of the board. And finally, he comes around rook f6 to f8 plan. And uh, yeah, the b7 pawn finally wins it. Okay. Well, nice game. For me, a really uh, titanic struggle. Um, and uh, somehow it really appealed to me that Aliakin just got clocked and then came right back into it, roaring into the game. It was very impressive to me. And then, you know, he comes roaring into the game and Lasker keeps his cool and, and still outplays him. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't seen that game either. Um, but fun game. Definitely has a lot of replayability. I can see that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well then, so I, time I for get the last word. I get Jesse's the last word. best game ever, pre nineteen twenty. Um. Yeah, I would say too, just about my list that games two through five. If you catch me on a different day, uh, I might say something different. But game number one is obvious i'm stunned well i'm not stunned with david you never know with david you never know this is obviously in my opinion it's not just my opinion it's everyone's opinion that this is the best game from this period um both and anyways i'm going to talk a little bit about it are so, you going to say the opera game of course it's I the think, opera. yeah opera of course game. It's the opera. opera game so let's talk a little bit classic about mm -hmm. it um, this you know, Kosti had this as number three, and one way I think, first of all, um, there are. I just want to just point out that if you wanted to be really nitpicky, I think. Are you showing the game now, Kosti? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you want to be really nitpicky, you can talk about this position. Um, see this position here and Bishop F seven wins cleaner because queen b7 and there's no queen b4 the idea of queen b7 is to play queen b4 so if you wanted to be super clean <laughs> you could say well maybe that's a little bit better um but let me speak a little bit about this game 
so one of the interesting things is uh, like a lot of people who've done chess for a long period in their life, I've taught a lot of chess. And one thing that's interesting about this game is you show it to an adult or a kid and you show it to them for the first time, it connects in a really interesting and compelling way that I've seen. Uh, and, and also for me, it also connects in terms of the aesthetic harmony of the pieces. Um, and one thing about art, right, is if you have novels that are written in the 1800s, do they still speak to the people of today? And so to me, it's very important when I think about books, for example, is do they have a, a staying power in terms of talking to people's hearts or souls or whatever you want to call it? And this one, of all the games out there, well, one of the reasons it's arguably number one there's a lot of top gms who call this their number one and i have a lot of sympathy for it because it connects to people's souls in a way that uh not every game does so and 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 yeah in terms of the aesthetic ideal that's then expressed in this position it's it's more than just a game it's like oh right i get it it's an ideal and that's what people are responding to whether they're rated uh, you know, 600 or 1800 or whatever, the first time they see it, it connects. So definitely that's why this is my top game from this period. Um, yeah, Jesse, I, let me just say something here after queen e7, um, mm -hmm. you mentioned bishop takes f7 check. I actually think it's not that clear after takes, takes bishop c5, because okay. black has, has counterplay here. So uh -huh. no, I, I think, I think Morphe just played a perfect game straight up. I think all his moves are best. Like after knight c3, it's just lost. Like I don't think black can defend this position. Um, and so so just to give credit to what you're saying, <laughs> I think it's straight up a perfect game. Um, and also what you said about it being like pretty inspirational, of course. Of course, it rings true. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was cool. So we had both, uh, you know, we had different... Um, kind of criteria and i can like i said i can imagine my other games make <laughs> changing up but but this game is definitely number one uh and if you were to force me right now we're, we'll do our ultimate top 10 later but this is definitely going to be a contender for the top game of all time yeah david all right. 21 I, i'm i'm definitely surprised i'm not going to say anything <laughs> rude about about it <laughs> oh you already did by not putting it in your list, Mouse. You already did. But Big, snub. Big snub. <laughs> Big snub. Big snub. So let's see. Well, at least it wasn't rude to you for me not to put in the list. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, yeah. So now what Tallying we're doing... up the scores. Mm -hmm. I've already tallied them. Um, and Coast, dude, there's a tie for fifth, sixth place, I think. So... Well, all right. Let me get that on the screen for you folks. Just a second here. But I do have an observation about Jesse and I, Kostya, which yeah. is that if you look at our lists, Jesse's list is almost all violent, brief, tactical games. And mine yes. is a lot of long end games. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jesse is a player who's played many great long uh, end games. True. And I'm a player who's played a lot of great brief uh, knockouts. So see where you're going with this. <laughs> yeah, what I'm trying to say here, and and I hope it's not, I I, I mean it's it's supposed to be very neutral and observational mm -hmm. and not insulting. What I'm seeing here is that maybe like Jesse's valuing some games that are different than the games that he himself plays, and I'm valuing games that are different than the games that I myself play. And uh you know. I'm less impressed by games that are more similar to what I've actually been able to learn and, and achieve some mastery of myself than games that are, that completely elude me as a, as an imitator. Yeah, actually that's interesting. I feel like I've heard that before where uh, players like really top players are often proud of the games um, that don't fit their, style like i remember hearing like kramnik or someone was super proud of like their tactical wins yeah and, uh, a guy like kasparov was prouder of his like positional squeezes because they were a little yeah. bit rarer for him i think the game i'm most proud of 
or one one of my most proud games is the one good technical game I ever won. And it's somewhat similar to the Lasker Al Yechen game, the, the technical one where the two rooks beat the rook and knight. Because I eventually won with two rooks against rook and bishop with my last pawn um, with some kind of like massive, insane um, uh, Tsugzwang. So... I guess yeah. if you just put it, if we were to contrast it, like to me, there's like, you're kind of like holding a diamond without much blemish, if you will. And then games like Yanowski, Capablanca just have too many questions. It's just too murky. I can't even, I don't even know where to start. In fact, <laughs> that game, David, oh man, like what, you're more ripped and so apart. <laughs> if you, maybe I'll do the video or rather when you do the video or that game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can read, you read your analysis. In any case, Gosio, I'm pull ready. up this final ranking, buddy. Let's see. Here it. are the final rankings, everyone. I'll read them out for our loyal podcast listeners. Um, tied for fifth place with six points. The way we did is we just did um, one through six. You know, first place pick gets six points, uh, and uh, sixth place pick gets one point. And um, we tally them up. So tied for fifth place, we have Rotlevy Rubinstein famous um uh, tarash game and lasker alakine um i'd give it to rot levy rubenstein just because both of you guys had it on your list whereas lasker alakine that was just david's top choice Got it. um i snubbed it but, it was my but now that you've pick seen for me. that game don't you kind of want to give it a point ghost no no, <laughs> no but... over <laughs> capablanca marshall oh my god no way no my my games were very like you would have to go through a bureaucratic process to like get a, a spot on my list to, to outstate right. one of the classics. I mean, <laughs> you have yeah. to, you have to first get a permit to then apply for a spot. Yeah. You got to apply and then you got to match up, you know, and I got to like play through like three times and every time, you know, you have to, you have to yeah. win. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, in fourth place with seven points, we have Anderson Kizaritsky, the uh, immortal game. Um, I had a number two, Jesse had a number five, and in the third spot, Lasker Capablanca, um, the long end game. This is David's number two game, and it was my number uh, four game for me. Second spot, we have the opera game with 10 points, number one for Jesse, number uh, three for me, and in first place, we have the Battle of Hastings, uh, Steinitz von Bartleben. Number one for me, number two for Jesse, and number um, six for for David. So uh, there you have it. That's the only game that was in all three of our lists, right? Within the yeah. top six. It's actually there are some other true. games you guys mentioned that I had in like seventh through tenth or whatever. If we'd gone even deeper, but it's it takes a long time because we wanted to go through all the all the we wanted to show all these games so you know what we're all talking about. <laughs> Yeah. cool all right okay well there you have it folks that was part one <laughs> next time we're gonna come back and do the best games between 1920 and 1972 that's gonna be hard by the way you know alakine played most of his games after 1920 and you got like botvinnik fisher tall like oh that's gonna be brutal brutal yeah. um i do kind of wish yeah. we had a full Maybe we can at some point expand and really get our full top ten list. Um, because we I've anyway. already got I've already got twenty games for next week's episode <laughs> that I'll have to call down to whatever five or six we we choose to go for. <laughs> yeah, do the okay. same thing um next time and uh, yeah, stay tuned. Stop.